Hello, I'm joined today by the UK's most feared comedian. It's Mr. Frankie Allen. Are you well, sir? I'm doing great today, GM. Hello to everybody and uh, looking forward to this today. I've known you for about 14 years now. 2009, yeah. About well, 2009 we met, I think, or 2008. We met at... Um, Nine, 2009. Hindley Junior's um, football club did a show with uh, Jamie Sutherland. Uh, he put you on and me on. Um, but I was quite scared of approaching you at yeah. the time because um, he told me the, he told me that you had a, he was a big gangster. You wore a, a big gold chain and you okay. had all your face bashed in. So when you oh. turned up with Paul Cronin and you stood at the bar, yeah, I thought, fucking hell, I'm not going near him. He'll probably like have me decapitated or something. No, all it was, Jim, I, I knew Jamie Sutherland. He worked as a teller. You know, he was behind the counter in Santander, it's called now. It was the Abbey National at the time. But he used to put a lot of shows on himself. And every year, or twice a year, he'd put a show on, a football presentation night at the Globe in Standish, yeah. not far from here in Wigan. And to be fair to him, he always kind of got me on there, a bit of a fan of mine, got talking to him. And then one day he said to me, I'd love to be a comedian. And uh, I'm fed up working you know as a clerk kind of thing or whatever you call them you know tell her so i said okay how do you want to start and he said i don't know where to start i said look you can get work straight away as a new comic phone a lot of agents up you might have to audition for them but you'll get work but you need a script and you need some gags and even if you're just standing there for half an hour reading them you need to uh, get it rehearsed so I invited him down to my house, came down to my house and um, I got some old scripts out and found out, got him up on the, on the floor and my, you know, kind of like just talking into a hairbrush, seeing what he was like, seeing what I could make of him, yeah. what his approach was, seeing what kind of material I thought would suit him. And we kind of wrote a script out. Fair play. And um, I was getting him a little bit of work. Um, anything that I couldn't do and people were saying, do you know anybody else? I'd say, well, okay, look, I've got this uh, friend of mine, he's starting off, he's gonna be very good and I'll get him for you, kind of cheap price. He was going in cheap just to get the work and uh, thought that was it really. He was up and running, getting busy. He came down to mine four or five times, went through his script, kind of modifying the rough edges of where he was going wrong and he was asking me questions. What do we do if we get heckled? So really I got him up and running and uh, the rest is history really, Jim. I didn't see him then until Hindley Junior's football club came around and he invited me to do a spot then and there and that's where I met you. I believe he's known now as the White Richard Pryor. Uh, so you, you've kind of yeah. like made a kind of put somebody on the map from comedy history and things. But your story is amazing. By the way, Jamie Sutherland, uh, that gig I met Frankie, well, you promised me 20 quid. And you never give it me. And I was on my ass at the time. Yeah, but so. Jamie, just tell me this, what it is. I'm not calling Jamie ungrateful or whatever, but it just seems strange that I'd done all that for him, you know, trying to help him. But then he was having a pop at me for you. You know, the way he described me, not very nice, was it? No, I was got scared. I, I didn't want him to go near you. I thought I'd get fucking put in a body bag and thrown in fucking sea or something. But what did he base that on, though? Just, and, and just like you said... There is um, a myth that precedes you in, show, in yeah. show business, like so. One thing will lead to another, but we'll, we'll kind of get on to that. But your story in comedy is it's like if you could equate it to a film, it's rocky. Yeah. You know, I mean, you spent years going through hell in clubs and getting bottled off and attacked on stage, anything that could happen to you. Yeah. And um, would you want to tell us your story about how well, basically, it? Basically, I think what you're alluding to, really, what you're leading to is how I came from absolutely being nowhere, virtually unknown across the UK to becoming famous. And it all happened because of a video that somebody made on Father's Day um, in 2017. I didn't even know it was being filmed. It was filmed, you know, on a pint glass. A lot of people say, when I see the viral video, you look taller. It was because of the angle of the phone while they were filming me on stage in this uh, show in Liverpool on Father's Day. And uh, then they kept the video in the phone and they released it, posted it 
exactly 12 months later, Father's Day 2 in 2018, and that kind of went viral, and the rest is history. But yeah, Jimmy, worked on the clubs all my life, a long time, um, never got anywhere at all. Done a little bit of TV, Opportunity Knocks with Bob Monkhouse in 1987, didn't win, and it's sad really because because I was always a blue comedian and I swore during the 80s and the 90s around the social clubs, that was never really acceptable. So I would only get the work that other comedians wouldn't do and they were rough, rough venues. So I had to learn how to manage myself, how to take care of myself and how to approach a rough audience. Um, so I'd go into pubs where fights would break out while I was on stage, a bit attacked many times on stage, really been hurt sometimes. And um, it's strange really, because it's done me the world of good. I can go into venues now where I can guarantee no other comedian in the UK would be able to handle the audience. They couldn't get them quiet. If you go into a crowd, if you're entertaining a crowd, which is very, very noisy, literally like a football match, like entertaining the cop or the Stratford End or whatever, you know, most comedians wouldn't be able to get ordered. They wouldn't get them quiet. They wouldn't be able to get them to listen, but I can get them quiet in a couple of minutes. And that's only because I've worked in that environment and I've learned how to handle those kind of venues and um, in a roundabout way, it's done me the world of good. I think you should actually be called the UK's most fearless comedian because some of the some of the places you must have worked in, well, any, like I said, anybody or any other comedian would have walked out or phoned their agent saying, I can't do this, it's, it's unworkable. Yeah. But I don't think there's nobody, and I'm not blowing smoke up your ass, I don't think there's another comedian in the country who can work any room. You know what I mean? This like comedy club comedians, for instance, they're only good in comedy clubs, and if you put them in like an all male environment, like a sportsman's dinner or something like that, now a lot of them crumble because they're they're yeah. actually not. They're, they're well, not as used I say, to that. It, it, you're exactly right. But it, it's it's be, being born out of necessity. It's worked well for me. I mean, during the nineties, sportsman's dinners were very popular, as you know. And you'd get two or three hundred lads in a room. You'd have something to eat. Then they'd have a sports personality, an ex cricketer, ex footballer, ex golf player speaking. Then the comedian would go on. They were very easy, very easy crowd for a comedian to entertain. Really a piece of piss. It wasn't hard. The lads were laughing as soon as you said hello, and you only had to do twenty minutes, and it was great. Now this is just an example of the way that. Not the agents really, but the way fate kind of conspired against me in the 80s and 90s, but now it's come good for me. There was a venue in Liverpool, and uh, I won't mention the name of it in case it's libelous or whatever, and it was a big function room. They used to have sportsman's dinners there all the time. The agents who used to book in there never used me. He'd never put me on, even though he knew and I knew I could go in and bring the fucking house down, bring the place to its hands and knees. A lot of the agents had a personal dislike for me for some reason because I was a bit of a maverick figure, never told the party line, didn't suck up to them, didn't um, give them what they thought the respect that they deserved. Underneath this venue, there was this fucking pub. It's a rough pub. Um, horrible. Uh, every bank holiday, all the smackheads, all the jailbirds, all the uh, criminals, everybody would get in there in the bank holiday afternoon and there'd be 200 people crammed into this tiny pub. And if you walked in there, you wouldn't be able to get near the bar. There were that many people in there. And you'd walk in and you'd go, you'd turn around and walk out and you'd go, you, you can't go on here. It's impossible. Yeah. You couldn't entertain people in here. And he always put me in that venue. Whether or not he was trying to bring me down to size, whether he was trying to kind of... Um, destroy me in a way by literally like a lion tamer literally throwing me to the lions thinking he's got no chance yeah. with that crowd on a bank holiday monday the actually it worked in reverse because i went in there and i found out that even with a crowd like that if you do the right material and you attack the crowd and you're more aggressive and more noisy than what they are then you'll get them to listen and in the end I used to bring the fucking house down in those places. So those comedians that were in the 
pie venues, I'd call them. Easy as fucking pie. Piece of cake venues yeah, yeah. that even the child would get laughs at. They're gone now. Yeah, yeah. I'm still working. I'm, I'm the one who's been left with the big name. Even though I was thrown to the lions in the 80s. They're the ones who are eating humble pie now because of Frankie Allen. And Frankie Allen, I can walk into any venue in the UK, doesn't matter where it is, and not one of these guys saying, oh, I don't like work in Newcastle, can't work in Portsmouth, he don't like me down there. I'll go anywhere, any kind of a crowd, and I'll bring the fucking place to its hands and knees. They, don't, they didn't realise, but by them doing that to you, they was forging you into what you became today kind of thing, you know, into a strong act that couldn't... It's versatile, I can work any room. Well, Jimmy, looking back, you're exactly right. They didn't know what they were doing. Um, probably thought, not intentionally and not with any malice, that they were destroying me. Probably thought, well, look, you know, in an agent's office, the phone would ring and someone would say, look, uh, this is so-and-so restaurant in Southport. We're looking for a comedian to come along and do 20 minutes. Um, we'll give him £300. They go straight to their favourite comedian, the list of comedians. Yeah. Whoever was the most compliant. Yes. Whoever was the most suppliant comedian that they had who'd been bowing and scraping to them all week. The comedians who went out for meals with them. The comedians who became a family friend. And the comedians who weren't not who who were not controversial. I've always been controversial because of my attitude and because of some of the material I've used. But the guys who played it safe, who weren't going to make any waves with the agents association, they got the easiest pie jobs. They got the pristine work and they made the money. Now with me, after all the comedians are booked out, you might get a guy phoning up on a Saturday morning. You see, all the prestigious venues are booked months in advance. All the restaurants and high-end social clubs, all the ticket shows, were booked six months in advance. So what you'd get on a Friday afternoon and a Saturday morning is rough pubs yeah. phoning up saying, the lads are going to match. They'll be out all day. They're getting back to the pub at seven o'clock. They've been drinking since nine. Can you get Frankie on? Yeah. <laughs> and then they'd ring me and I'd have to go. And touch wood, I've never gone anywhere in this country where I've walked in and walked out. You know, I've actually gone into places and been fighting with people as soon as I've walked in. Someone said they need a scouse there, whatever they've said. Or, you know, are you from up north? And it's gone off. I've been fighting. But I've gone on the stage and done it. Only because I was kind of, you know, convinced that I had a lot of talent. And I knew one day I'd be vindicated um, about what I'd done. I always had the conviction that the material I was doing and the approach that I had that there was a market for, and that's what people really wanted. So talk about uh, at the end of the storm. I've come through it now. Uh, would it do it again? Um, yes and no. I mean, I've had some very hairy, people wouldn't believe. I tell people things that have happened to me while I've been working in clubs, and uh, they literally can't believe it, you know. Take going right back, did you want to be a comedian when you was a kid? Or was it an accidental thing that it became a very... I wanted to be a comedian when I was a kid. I used to do a lot of impressions in school, taking the piss out of the teachers, but actually impersonating their voices. And when the teacher would go out the room, go to the staff room, when the class was left on its own, I used to jump up on the stage where the teacher's desk was. And as soon as he'd walked out, you know, I'd do his voice, but make it funny. You know, we had this guy, Mr. Young, and French teacher, and he used to say, yes, um, if you turn to page three, <laughs> you, you could possibly, no, you go, je t'aime, je t'aime. So he'd, as soon as he went out of the room, I'd jump up and go, yes, gentlemen, please get your dicks out. Now, get your dick out and look on the end of it and, 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 and they get the page book and, and just rub it, page three. <laughs> used to do all that. And I used to get a great, like just like now, working in the clubs, the whole of the fucking class would be pissing themselves. Then I'd be sitting down and they'd be saying, Frankie, get the teacher's gonna get up and do some impressions. Do an impression, impression of the headmaster, who used to stutter. You know, so I'd, I'd get up and go, are you people? Playing ducks and drakes with me. Ducks and drakes with me. So you said this ducks and drakes. Only said it once. 
But I should just go, go taxi breaks, taxi breaks, taxi breaks. They're going to be pissed themselves. So it was very surreal. And then when I was a teenager, started going out with my mate, mate of mine, he's still a very good friend of mine now, a guy called Foxy, Peter. And he was doing impressions. He used to do impressions of all the old gangsters. And after we'd been out drinking, I was 17, 18 at the time, we'd be on the street corner and we'd all be half pissed. And he used to do this guy called Edward G. Robinson. Yeah, yeah. And I'd be standing there and, and, and Peter started it to be fair to him. It wasn't me. And he'd go, I try, I try, yeah. They say, they say Fay Ray died of VD. I said, Al Capone, Al, girls like Fay Ray don't die of VD. I said, they do if they're giving to me. And I started doing impressions he was doing. Yeah. There was a, a show on in the 70s and 80s on the TV called Paint and Place. A soap opera it was oh, on yeah. every day. Right. And there was an old fellow, it was an actor called Wilfred Hyde White. And um, he played Martin Payton, this old millionaire in his 80s. And uh, he had a chauffeur called Weber. Big American guy with a big chauffeur's hat on and things. And Peter, my mate Foxy, he used to come, he, at night when we were outside the pub, he'd lean as though he's leaning on his dick and he'd, go, he'd be doing Martin Payton and then he'd go, Wabba, Wabba, I've seen you down on the wharf with Adrian Van Lyden. And I'd be Martin Payton then and I'd be uh, Weber, the chauffeur, and I'd go, and he should smoke and he'd smoke and he'd go, Why, Mr. Payton, Adrian and I are close friends. And it kind of caught on, all the lads were doing it and we were doing it all the time in the pub. Then we'd go to town, into Liverpool at night We'd end up in a Chinese restaurant, pissed, and I'd just get up and start doing it in front of the whole of the restaurant. And people loved it, and I liked the acclaim I was getting, and it went on from there. What was the first step onto a, a real stage? Was it, I'm right in thinking it was some kind of talent show? Or am I wrong well, in thinking? Well, no, that? Jim, what it was, a friend of mine called Danny, Danny Downing, who's a great comedian now, as we speak, a very close friend of mine um, all my life. He was living in Kensington at the time. Now, I lived most of my life in Kensington in Liverpool, but uh, I, I'm originally from Old Swan, just up the road. So he came round to my house. I was only a kid, 18, 19, what it was, the end of the 70s. And he said, Frankie, there's a club in Kensington on Shield Road. Today, on a Sunday, they have two strippers on and they have a comedian. It's called the MA Club, the Merseyside Artists Club. He said, a few of the lads are going down. Do you want to go down there? And I didn't drive. He drove. So we both went down there. And the only way I could describe it when I walked in, it was like a scene from that movie, The Deer Hunter, where Christopher walked and is sitting there and he's playing Russian roulette. Thousands of people crammed into a tiny room. Yeah. Full of smoke. Very, very noisy. Yeah. So I go into this room. Jimmy, I mean, this was like, got to be 76. Six or 75, 76, got in the room. You couldn't get in full of lads who you can just look at and see they were still pissed from the night yeah, before. Yeah. They had a comedian from wherever, from out of town, not from Liverpool, that had come on at one o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, but it was fucking rough and no comedian stood the chance. First time I was there, this guy came out and he picked the mic up. Before he picked the mic up, he was getting heckled and he went, you know, uh, I went into the tailors the other day and a fella just jumped up and said, is that where you got that fucking stupid suit from? You fucking dickhead, fuck off. So there were no comedians at all that could last longer than two minutes. They all walked off. Yeah, yeah. Now, the management realised the place was very, very rough and there were a few fights now and then in the, in the room. But... I'm not sure what it was. They just felt as though they should put a comedian on every week. Then one comedian came on and had a terrible time. Really terrible time. And I could see he was very upset when he walked off. So all the lads were shouting out, uh, take your fucking stupid comedians back to Blackpool or wherever they were from. And a comedian, Joey Blake, but the, the compare Joey Blake more said, listen lads, you know, can any of you do any fucking better? And went a little bit quiet and he said I'll tell you what to do starting from today we'll have a joke of the week contest 
anyone in the audience can get up and tell a joke. If they can finish the joke, they'll win two quid, which is like getting a grand now. Really? Yeah. No, it's like getting a, like 50 quid. Yeah. Anyway, a couple of fellas got up and this fella got up and he went, fellow went to ch fuck off, everyone shouting fuck off and throwing things. Jimmy, you've seen nothing like it in your life. Like the Blues Brothers, I wonder it wasn't a cage, throwing ashtrays at him. So he had to walk off. And my mate was saying, Frankie, get up. So uh, I said, oh, fuck, okay. Okay, I'll get up. So I got up and strange enough, Jimmy, as soon as I picked the mic up, I took to it like a duck to water. Yeah. And I attacked the crowd. I said, look at this, look at this fucking big fat cunt. You fat bastard. Everywhere went quiet. Then I'd walk into the crowd and say, what's your name, mate? I my name's Billy. What do you do? I'm a taxi driver. You fucking dickhead. And all the lads were screaming, laughing. So I did it and I won the Joke of the Week contest for six weeks on the run. Anyway, there was a guy sitting in the crowd one week and it was Don Navarro. Anyone remembers the boys from the black stuff? He, remember, he, he was the guy who was called Shake Hands. Yeah, he shook everyone's hand, he crushed a hand. Yeah, yeah. Great actor. His name was Don Navarro. A lot of people called him Iggy Navarro. That was another name he had. And he approached me, he said, Frank, you can have a word with it. And I said, what is it? He said, what it is? He said, I'm an actor. He said, but I run an entertainment agency called CCN. And we book out clubs all over the northwest of England. And I think you've got a lot of potential. I'd like to start you off. Okay. So he started getting me work. But because during the 70s and 80s, the social clubs were booming. There was three or four acts on every night, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I didn't have the material to do an hour. So I'd go on in between acts. If they had a band on at first, eight o'clock, they'd play till a quarter to nine. Then they had to strip down before the singer came back on. So as they're stripping down, there was a 10 minute window. So they'd throw me on and I'd run on. Normally down a walkway, they used to have these walkways you'd pull out. You must have played on them, Jim. It's kind of a landing strip and it goes right into the crowd. They used yeah, to have it in a lot of clubs. Down. And the MC would say, this guy's only a, quid, uh, only a kid, he's only 19. They go, oh. And a lot of places, um, they liked me because they must have thought that he's only a kid and he's trying. Yeah, yeah. And, and it just kind of progressed and went on from there. So you, from day one, the confrontational style was there. You, you, of like, you would be combative with the audience. Well, no, it didn't because I was doing impressions. And it was a kind of... Um, when you're doing impressions, you're kind of behind a screen. It's not interactive. You're not involved in the audience. You're not picking on people. They're not heckling you. It's almost as you could be, you know, a kind of a hologram, really, of somebody. You're standing there. You're doing these voices. I'm waiting at the end of each impression to see if the audience is going to applaud. And I, I've got to become in kind of like a character, the Frankie Allen character, evolved purely by accident. And I'll tell you exactly what that was. I was in a club in Winsford in Cheshire, and I was on stage, and I was doing Rolf Harris. I was doing an impression of Rolf Harris. I had this false beard, glasses, and it came out, and I was going, you know, I, I remember when I was a kid in Australia, I fell in the creek in our place, couldn't swim, scrambled at a bank. I'm doing this impression of Rolf Harris, and this fella started heckling me. Fuck off. Fuck off, you dickhead. So, he really, this particular night, I don't know what it was, he really made me angry. So I still have this fucking beard on, came out of the Rolf Harris character, and became Frankie. And I said, you fuck off. You fucking dickhead, you ugly twat. And then I got a huge laugh. And I thought, where's this going? And on the way home, my mate, it was Danny, my mate who's working in Benidorm now, he said, Frankie, did you hear the laughs you were getting when you had to go with the heckler? And I said, what, what was it like? He said, it was just like, as soon as you said, you fuck off, you ugly twat. I said, there was a huge roar around the room. And I said, well, why are they laughing if I'm being offensive? Sort of don't know. So done a couple more shows where I tried to have a go at the audience, kind of inviting hecklers. And I found that once somebody went one to one with me, the real or the new image that Frankie Allen came out, 
like a boxer that had never boxed before and I took to it like a duck to water and savaged people and got huge laughs. So then I thought, okay, drop the impressions. Don't do any more impressions ever. Concentrate on stand-up material. Telling jokes, when you're doing the impression, I've been doing it for two or three years before I ever told a joke, a normal gag. You're using your time in any way because there's a gag at the end, there's a punchline at the end of your impression. So it was a big advantage to be on stage as it is to be on stage doing anything. Uh, gave me a lot of, uh, got, got me time in right for when I made the transition into a stand-up comic. But no, you know, kind of the stand-up Frankie Allen didn't evolve until about three years after I've been on stage as an impressionist. How long did it take you to know with the material? Jimmy, it's strange because I never really got an hour's worth of material and I got into a lot of trouble in the in the, the, the mid 80s, early 80s. At the time, the social clubs were booming. Everybody wanted a singer on, he wanted a comedian on and a band to finish the night off. So you're talking about Labour clubs, Conservative clubs, Catholic clubs, British legions, they were all full. So you'd have two or 300 people a night in the clubs and they wanted entertaining from seven o'clock till midnight. So it was all time based. If you couldn't do your time, if a comedian was yeah. booked for an hour and he only walked on and done 10 minutes, then there was nothing to do for half an hour. And the organist, the drum, drummer would have to come on and play for an extra half an hour. Yeah. They weren't happy about that. So there was a big gap in the night and they wanted the, the night to run smoothly. So I was getting booked out to the comic 84, 85, they wanted a comic to do two sessions on stage. Very, very difficult to do two 40 minute spots with Jimmy. It's impossible, it really is. It's taken me a lifetime to be able to do the two sessions, the two spots. So there was a comic called, and I was going around, and what they used to do, if you went into a club and you went on, and I used to go on, do half an hour, going down quite well, like in the 80s. And then they'd come up to you in the dressing room and they'd say, right, what do you do in the second half? And I'd say, well, I can't do a second half. And they'd go, well, okay then, well, if you can't do it, you're not going back on stage. We're paying you 80 quid to do two sessions. So where's 40 quid? Fuck off home. And that's what they used to do. It's called getting paid off. So I was getting paid off all the time. Never got me full money. Used to do half an hour at a stretch or 25 minutes. Didn't have the material to do another half an hour. And then one night I was just out somewhere and I was speaking to a friend of mine who was an old time comedian called Johnny Mack. Now Johnny Mack was a brilliant comedian, hilarious, very, very funny. He's gone now, he passed away a few years ago. He actually won Opportunity Knox in 1975, yeah. which was a big talent show on the TV. And the Lord Mayor of Liverpool took him on the show and he became a kind of a local star. He was doing great. And he had some great material, Jim. He used to come out on stage and uh, he'd say, uh, and he had a funny way of talking. He had a bit of a lisp. And he'd say, uh, yes, um, yeah, what it was, a mate of mine came up to me. He said, they broke me leg in three places last night. And I said, bloody hell, you want to keep out of those kind of places? And, uh, and, and the doctor said, so I'm going to put this plaster of Paris on your leg. Now, uh, don't be climbing any stairs when you've got this plaster of Paris on your leg. And fucking hell, I believe he made a terrible noise getting up the drain pipe every night to get into bed. His stuff was very silly, but he's very yeah. good. So he was a kind of demigod at the time yeah. that I looked up to. And we were in a club one night and we were talking to him, me and Danny, me mate, you know, the comedian Danny Downing at the bar. And I said, Johnny, I'm having a terrible time. Um, I can't do two spots on the clubs. I can only do one. And it's killing me even getting half an hour together. Very difficult to get material together. I said, how am I going to get paid? What do we do for the second half? He said, dead easy, this one. He said, go on, do every gag you've ever thought of, all your best material. Go into the dressing room when the fella comes in and say, what do you think of that? And he goes, oh, you were good. Yeah, I'll do better in the second half. Then say to him, if you've got me money, then he'll pay you for the whole night. Put the money in your pocket. I said, Johnny, but what happens when I go back on in the second half? What do we do? So he went, nothing. <laughs> so I said, what do you mean, nothing? He said, just stand there. 
<laughs> he said, you got the money. Who gives a fuck? <laughs> he said, they're ready, up and ready all the time to pay you off, to fuck you off. He said, this is a good way to get your own back. Fuck them off. Do every gag you've ever thought of. Pick on the people. Stretch it out. Exhaust yourself. Be in the dressing room at half nine, knowing that you're going to go on stage and you've got no... You can't even remember a gag from when you were at school. <laughs> Walk out as though you're going to do 45 minutes. I said, what do we do? He said, just stand there. Fuck about it. Fuck about. So I said, fucking hell. Anyway, Jimmy worked like a charm. But because you'd done well on the first half, she, the, 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 the strange thing and the sad thing, the difficult thing about if you've got two sessions to do, the big temptation is to try and do the two, to save material that you'd normally use in the first half for your second session to try and make that strong. And it just couldn't be done. And by taking material out of your first half show, your first performance, you're weakening the first half. Yeah. So it was just impossible. It's literally trying to ride two horses. So I used to go on, dead confident, knew I only had to do 20 minutes, bring the house down in place with all my strong material, come off and the fellow would go, oh, that was great, Frankie, what time do you want to go back on? Sometimes they'd say, right, it's a quarter to 10 now. Could you take us through till half 10? That's what they used to say. I'd go, no problem. Do you want me to... Bring it up to 11. Oh no, quarter to 11 is great. That I'd know I'd go on stage and have nothing. And it worked well because the audience liked you because you'd done well in the first half. So in the second half, you'd start talking and it'd give you the time to relax. Then you'd start remembering gags that maybe you'd missed out in the first half. You started doing them, interacting with the crowd, anyone's birthday today. It was a great experience. And then, I wrote a script out of some new material I'd heard and although I didn't know it, I didn't, couldn't remember it for the second half, I used to write it all out and where the speakers were in the club, you, you, either side of you, normally you've got two big PA speakers, both speakers. Yeah. I, I wrote the material out, which is very innovative of me, yeah, I thought yeah. very clever, wrote out the material and taped it to the back of the speakers. So sometimes I'd be on stage, all of a sudden, blank, no gags coming to mind, no routines, didn't know what to say, just glance over, nobody could see me, and see aeroplane routine. Yeah. You went to the airport, then I was away then. I went to the airport on Wednesday. Got on the plane, was very nervous. I said to the pilot, how often do these planes crash? And he said, once. So it was all there for me, but having the material to hand as well yeah. made me more confident that I could go on, ad-lib, do what I wanted to, and if it did get a stumbling block, like, you know, writers get blocks, but comedians get them all the time, where suddenly you can't think of anything. I just glance over, and there'd be material there waiting for me. So then, that's how I began to be able to do the two spots. Did you ever write the gags on your hand, or do you no, never do that? No, never do that. A lot of comics do it. A lot of comics who are working now do it, but... Everyone can see it, you know. And it smudges as well. It, it smudges when you sweat as well. And you, you're going like this all the time. You need something that they're not... You know, I can glance at the back of the speaker. Nobody... You'd have to really be very clever to see my eyes moving yeah, a yeah. few... A couple of feet onto, onto the back of the speaker. But these guys that keep going like this... Yeah, I, I went into the butchers. And, I, and then have you seen them where they're, they're trying to read it? You know, yeah, yeah. so people in the crowd, they get on it, they realise this twat's fucking reading off the back of his hand. So I, I've never gone for that reading off your hand thing. The strongest part of your, well, the best part, I think what, what makes you unique from any other comedian is the crowd work. Yeah. The, 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 how you attack the crowd and it, you make it look like it's, obviously there's some, there's this kind of a relative kind of script in yeah. you know, what you're going to do, but it just looks to anybody who's seen you for the first time, like you just reeling it off the top of your head. How long did it take you? to uh, develop your crowd work section of your act? See, I may be giving secrets of my success away a little bit, but then again, nobody else can do it, or they, a lot of people wouldn't have the nerve to do what I do. What I found, if you've got a comedian on stage and he's telling gags, he's telling material, if he's using the third person singular, I think is the term, where you're, if you're 
telling a story. Somebody in the crowd sitting there and a fellow comes on and goes, I was in the library the other day and I said, um, a blue book, a green book. And so you're in the audience, you're trying to imagine in your mind this library. You're trying to imagine that guy going in the library. So you're following him. And then he says, I went into the butchers. So you're going, okay, we're going into the butchers. It's very abstract. It's like listening to a story. You know, like listening when you were a kid to a bedtime story. You're going to get 10 times the amount of laughter when people are frightened. That's why people go into, when you get people going the pictures, they're in the dark. Anything at all, when you're watching a movie in a cinema that comes on, which is remotely funny, the whole of the pictures pisses themselves because subconsciously they feel a bit frightened because they're in somewhere dark. Now, if I'm attacking people, it puts them on edge. Now, I say to someone, hey, you, you fucking cross-eyed twat, I'll punch your fucking head in. For a split second, a millisecond, they believe that. Then when they realise that it's just fun, that I don't mean it, it's a joke, then that's when you get the release of laughter. But by putting people on that kind of defensive level, you're always going to get a huge, a, a much bigger laugh than you would if you were telling them an innocent story. From being an impressionist starting out to developing the Frankie Allen act of savaging the crowd, what's the timeline? How long did it take you to get from doing your impressions to actually get into where you had, where you had the act and you go out and you... Well, Jim, a similar story to yourself, really. You know more than me what it's like to be, what's the word? Um, vilified. No. Vilified, but marginalised. We've all yeah. been there. When you're a comedian who's not kind of like um, on the straight and narrow, or you're doing something off the wall that nobody else is doing. Now with me, because I was blue and I was swearing a lot, the only work that would, as I say, the only work that I'd get very rough venues. And then when I tried to get on the clubs that the other comedians were on, where the good money was and where the big crowds were on the social clubs, then I would, I'd be blacklisted. They wouldn't allow me to. The Agents Association, they'd ring everybody up. Don't put Frankie Allen in that venue. Yeah, yeah. He'll cause trouble. He'll say something offensive. So I was kind of, um, you know, working in the shadows for a long time. I was the kind of Robin Hood of comedy. I was the elephant in the room. All the agents knew how good I was like in the 80s and 90s, they knew I could wipe the floor with every other comedian, but they wouldn't give me any work because I didn't tow the party line. I was a rebel. So in a lot of ways they tried, and they did do it for a while. They tried to destroy me completely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you've had it yourself, Jim. You've had it where, you know, the, the kind of... Um, ringing up venues, don't put Frankie Allen on, so you've got him on tomorrow night, don't have him on, um, he's too risky, he might say something controversial, he's too blue, and then they fabricate things, they make stories up, he, he caused trouble in the yeah. club last week, things that never happened, or things that other comedians have said, which were not very nice, uh, they attribute them to you, you know, yeah. they label you, they're very good at pigeonholing you. I can wear clean as well. I can do shows yeah, yeah. where I don't swear. And I've done thousands of them where I've walked into venues in a nice place, Wilmslow in Cheshire, form beyond Merseyside. You walk in and you know straight away these people don't want language. Yeah, yeah. I can do material, which and I've done thousands of shows. But the agents, because they pigeonhole you, they're so narrow-minded, they don't think that you would have the ability to do a blue show and to do a clean show as well. So it's very frustrating. It's uh, it's strange in a way because- They insult your intelligence, Jim. Because if they'd have nurtured you and, you know, got behind you, they they would have in turn made a lot of money off you. But it's, it makes it think it's not really about the talent. It's more about the control, it's the power. It's kind of the power bit they enjoy of like, Axe ringing up, have, have you got any work, uh, you know, and all this kind of thing. I'll, I'll do tryouts for you. It's well, like, as you say, Jim, during the 80s and the 90s, and even the 2000s, the last few years as well, the whole of the entertainment industry, entertainment industry, has run on on kind of, um, you've got to be supplant, is that the word? Compl compliant. Compliant. Yeah. Uh, supplicate 
is the word, isn't it? Yeah. To the agents who see themselves as the big bosses. Now, if you go against that, if you say, now many times when I'd been blacklisted by the agents and they'd rang everywhere up and nobody was giving me any work, I wouldn't accept that because I always had the confidence and always had the conviction in the style of comedy I was doing and the material that I was doing. I knew people wanted that, but they didn't want to face that. So they tried to destroy me. So what I did, I'd go into clubs, you know, and say, can I speak to the manager and come along and say, look, um, if you phone up an agent for me, they're going to give you a bad time. Don't book Frankie, but I'd like to come on your club. And what I had to do, I'd say to them, can you put me on next Saturday night? Um, I'll do it for nothing. If I don't bring the house down, um, don't give me anything at all. But I guarantee in this room, I'd know the room, I'd know the area. I'll go down very, very well. And then I'd ask you to pay me. And it worked like a charm. I was going in places and um, going on stage under no pressure because I wasn't getting the phone ringing on Monday from the agent saying you were very blue, you were swearing. I'd go into the venue, do it for nothing and bring the house down. Then the guy would come up and they'd go, Frankie, you're brilliant tonight. Here's a hundred quid. I don't know what the agent was talking about. And it took a long time. In the end, the agent started to accept very reluctantly that I was talented and I could work on the big clubs. Do you think they finally capitulated that you, you are the talent that you are? Well, yes and no. I mean, for the last 20 years or so, I've been the kind of elephant in the room where I've heard them speaking and other comedians who couldn't hold a candle to me, they talk about them amongst themselves in hushed tones. Yes, then they say on the phone to each other, yes, I'll put Eddie in that venue. Have you tried Victor? He'd do very well. They knew that I, if I went in there that Saturday, I'd bring the place to its hands and knees, but they wouldn't use me. No. Because they had a personal grudge against me for the character that I was. So, I, you know, they would not accept. And in the end, as you say, to an extent, They've accepted, but even now, a lot of the people, it's they'd never speak about me. No. If you've got four or five agents here, old time mainstream agents that run the clubs around Manchester Merseyside, they'd be talking, I won't mention names, they'd all be talking about so and so very good. Yes, I think it's me. My name would never come up. No. And your name would never come up. No. You'd never be mentioned. If someone had the audacity to mention my name, they go, um, more tea, more tea, then they'd Victor. be looking for an Achilles heel they'd say yeah. you have to be very careful where you put Frankie I believe he got stabbed I believe he fought he was fighting in Manchester I believe he rode into a club on a horse and started hitting everyone with pint glasses Fucking making stories up. Yes, Frankie. He was on with two strippers, wasn't he? I know. He shagged one on stage. Then he jumped around and he started doing the twist with nothing on. He picked the mic up and he went, fuck off. And then he disappeared in a cloud of smoke. And they go, yes, I've heard that. I have heard that about Frankie. I wouldn't like to put him in a Catholic club if he does that. No, no, I'm keeping away from him. I've known, like I said, I've known you a long time, and um, you've, I've always just going your race. I agree with you. you but you're doing look. very well, Jim. <laughs> yes, now I this is Jimmy O. This is another comedian that was totally ostracised by the mainstream entertainment agents in the northwest and vilified, vilified, crucified on the altar of entertainment. But here he is doing a podcast. I think he's done very well. I have had my own bin round cleaning wheelie bins. Um, if anyone needs a windy, wheelie bin cleaning, I am available. Well, well yes, I, and I, I've noticed, Jim, you've grown your hair long, and I think that this is a good indication of your success. Frankie is a Ketwig. I actually sell Ket at festivals. I'm uh, looking forward to the world opening up again. I'll be selling ketamine to children. Well... What happened with me, Jim? I had a huge head of hair, only until last Friday, actually. And I went to sleep, 
And my son, who's my manager, rang me in the morning to say, we've got no work tomorrow. And within hours, my hair had fallen out. I thought he said to you, uh, you have to shave your hair off and we'll give you a showcase in Portsmouth. Well, year. I tried that. Now, at the time, I was doing very, very well. I was doing very well. I was a gitvok. I was a gitvok. And what a gitvok is, if you don't know, is somebody who crawls on the hands and knees like this to an agent and goes... <laughs> Can I give you a little blowjob? <laughs> and what they do, they, give, they play the guitar and they sing and they go, like a rainstone cowboy. Then uh, during the week, they could go to for a meal with the agents and the agents say, mm, 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 right, oh, cowboy, they go, thank you. <laughs> One thing I, I respect about you is um, you never get starstruck. You work with quite a lot of famous people and... It always sticks in my head. You always said, who the fuck are they? Jimmy, you know, the big stars, or people look up at the big stars, are very down to earth, the lovely people. The phonies are these people who've kind of like semi-made it, or they've got a little bit of stardom, a little bit of recognition. They're the ones that think the big time and looking down the nose at you. Now, last night, sadly, you know, it's Mother's Day today, so whenever this goes out, people realise Marvin Hagler passed yeah. away fantastic you know he's a legend one of the best boxers that has ever been in in the world and i had the opportunity the privilege to meet him three or four times and work with him now i looking looked him up last night on my phone passed away sadly but he was worth 45 million dollars mm -hmm. now when i met him didn't he just like talking to you he wasn't like you know walking around i've got 45 he was just down to earth, and that's yeah, yeah. what you find. The bigger the star, the more down to earth they are. I believe you had uh, an altercation with a, a once famous TV couple over at a, a Richmond Sausage Convention or something. Yeah, what it was, it was about 10 years ago, and uh, this agent rang me up. Obviously, they must have been stuck for a comic. Most of the other comedians at the time were out, and they were actually crawling to the clubs on the hands and knees. And they were go, going in and they go, hey, yeah, the agent sent me. So I got this call, can you do this Christmas party? And the Christmas party was in this um, big stately home in Cheshire. And it was for this company. I'm not sure what the company was. I don't think it was a sausage company. It was something else. And uh, the two directors of the company were coming along. They were big stars on the TV at the time in the 80s and 90s. They had their own morning kind of chat show yeah. magazine program. Uh, and they came along and uh, when I was on stage doing my show, they were at the front and they were shaking their heads and they were making noises and tutting and just being horrible. You know, they didn't like me. And uh, later on, me and my mate that I was with Ernie, we walked into this VIP lounge and there's the two of them standing there. And... Uh, he just started being weird at me and the girl the woman said excuse me frankie mr oh no mr comedian chappie she said i don't like the material that you use i didn't think you'll get anywhere with it you shouldn't be using that kind of language i think it's disgusting so i just said well that's your opinion isn't it you know and then the guy very famous guy who's like the, his her partner he started kicking off at me you know from the bar You'll never get on a television and all that. So then I just kind of like let it ride over me. Then she said something kind of very insulting. She said, I wouldn't have you on my show. You're disgusting. You're a disgrace. You shouldn't even be on a stage. And I said, fuck off. Go fuck off, you fucking fat swat. And she went, and his face, he went, Oh, oh, and I said, and you, you cunt, you can fuck off, you fucking dickhead. And the fellow who was running the show, he'd been a bit frightened before it went on. He mentioned them, he said, you know, the celebrity couple, they're coming in, Frankie, don't say anything to them. And I said, I treat everyone in the audience the same way. So he kind of came into the room just as I was telling the, 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 the woman to, to fuck off. So, as I'm shouting fuck off, he ran in at the back. It was like a pantomime. And he saw what was going on. And he went, put his hands on his head. He went, 
Frankie! No! <laughs> and I went, oh yes! And you can fuck off, you can all fuck off! And I went. It's but he actually got caught, uh, her husband got caught fucking shit. Uh, I don't know whether you can say that, because yeah, okay. they know who it was yeah. straight away. Anyway, yeah. Um, have you always had an unshakable confidence in yourself as, an, as a performer? Jimmy, you've got to be, and you have. I mean, look at the knocks that you've had yourself personally, Jim. People, I mean, we can laugh now. People have actually launched campaigns. I'm not just saying somebody on the phone talking to somebody else saying, oh yeah, Jimmy, oh, I don't really rate him. I wouldn't use him. People have gone out of the way as though it was a project in school, you know, to say, how can we destroy <laughs> Jimmy? Oh, and sat up all night. Well, what can we do today? People have done it on a daily basis. They used to do it with me. You've had it the last few years from different people because you've said things about where you live in Wigan. You've had a lot of the local agencies coming onto you, you know, kind of trying to destroy you. And if you've said something contentious, you know, they're hovering like a vulture above you, yeah. trying, you know, reading everything that you say, listening to everything that you say to see if you're doing anything that they don't like. Do you think uh, political correctness has killed comedy? Well, it hasn't killed it because although a lot of people are frightened, genuinely scared to speak the way they used to speak 20 years ago. I think freedom of speech is gone now in, this UK, in the UK. I think that you're only allowed to say certain things. It's very reminiscent of the Soviet Union, isn't it, when, when I was a kid? It's very, very similar. You know, you can be prosecuted just for using a, a term or a word. It's quite sad in a way, but you can still be funny you know, it's as though they've given you a directive and they're saying, look, don't say this, don't say that, don't say that. And you, as a comic, you can go along with that and you can still be funny. But sadly, the list of things that you can say is shrinking compared to the list of things that you're not allowed to say. So I think in the end, if it carries on like this, in another 10 years, there'll be three, four times more things that you can't say than what you can say. So it's very really sad. But the calibre of you as a comedian, I mean, you see some of the, a lot of, a lot of these what end up on pal, panel shows. They've just been going about six months in a comedy club in London. Yeah. And they've ended up on a panel show. Then, um, and you see them and, and what the, the humour, the, I can't watch one. When I go to somebody's house and that, there's these panel shows on. I just feel sick because they well, just... Well, look to me, I don't really want to talk about that style of comedy. If people like it, great. And if they feel that what they're doing is funny, great. You know, there's room in the business for all different types of comedy. But it is kind of, um, you know, middle-class humour. I'm very much so like yourself. I'm a working-class yeah. comic. And working-class people swear. Working class people don't think about what they say. Yeah. Working class people savage each other. It's something we've done for hundreds of years in this country, standing around fireplaces in coffee houses and pubs hundreds of years ago, taking the piss out of each other. It's just a laugh. And people nowadays read too much into it and they're trying to dissect everything you say and pass judgment. How can you pass judgments on things that people say? You know, don't say that. That could be offensive to some. It's just, it's gone to the stage now where it's laughable. What's the baddest time you've had on stage or in a club? What's the worst? Well, Jimmy, I've, I mean, I've been in some life-threatening situations where I've been stabbed, lost a lot of blood, nearly died. I've been filled in by five or six fellas where I thought I was going to die. I've been threatened in places where I've had, you know, whole tables, seven or eight fellas jump up, ready to yeah. fill me in. I've had to escape from places. I've had to dive in my car. I've been chased through the countryside, me and two strippers in 87, chased through the countryside of Cheshire with these fellas in a car behind us, banging into the back of us trying to get us off the road so they could fill us in. The girls were screaming. Uh, I don't know whether people out there may not remember. There used to be a device, in a, a security device in your car called a crew clock. Yeah. Do you remember them, Jim? Yeah, the yellow thing. Yellow thing, a yellow metal thing. And when you parked up, you could fit it across your gear stick 
and um, your hand break and nobody could pinch the car because they couldn't get it off. So I had one of those in my Ford Capri, which is a fucking fast car. I'm getting chased through Newcastle underline, the countryside down in Cheshire Stoke by this gang of lads. Something had happened in the club and they were after us. And uh, I just had to get the crew clock and throw the crew clock out of the window. Like a film. Like a movie. And uh, hit the car, you know, hit the windscreen, just like a film. And they went far like that and they went right through a hedge yeah. and into a field and we got away. <laughs> but the girls were terrified and I knew I had to do something. So that's where, you know, a lot of the times around the clubs, I've had a lot of experiences where really kind of um, your self-preservation instinct kicks in. It's, um, you, you was on the verge of fame with Opportunity Knox. Did you come second in Opportunity in Knox in 88? Jenny, it was 87. 87. Now I auditioned because of the prejudice um, that I was experiencing in Liverpool from a lot of the other acts who were very clean, hated me, and from a lot of the agents who would never give me any work. When the audition for Opportunity Knox came up in Liverpool at the Grafton Rooms, um, I said to the agents I was working for in Manchester, he said, it's only around the corner from you. I said, no, I'm not doing Liverpool because I knew they'd all be there at the front, baying for blood, yeah, yeah. waiting to see me fail, hoping um, that I'd fall flat on my face. So he said, well, there's another agent, there's another audition for Opnox coming up in Pip's Club, it was called, in Manchester. And I said, great, I'll go to Manchester. So I auditioned in Manchester in 87 for Opportunity Knox. I was the first act to be picked to go on the first show yeah. of the first series of Bob Monkhouse from a quarter of a million acts. So I really thought it was on my way, Jim. And um, even Bob Monkhouse, when I met Bob, he says to me, Frankie, you know, you're a fantastic comedian. You're going to be a huge star. This was in the BBC, in the rehearsal rooms. And Stuart Morris, who was the producer, said, Frankie, I've never... And even then he said, Frankie, I've never seen anyone like you. You know, he went, yeah. you're fantastic, it's brilliant. If you do the same stuff, you're going to go through the roof. You'll have your own show. So when I went down to get it filmed in March the 19th of 87, um, I really had great expectations. Now, on the night... They had a band called Four Wheel Drive, who were very good, but I don't think they were going to win. They had a guy playing classical piano, who was very good as well. They were all top acts. Um, I was on with a girl called Kerry Wilson. Now, Kerry Wilson was a young girl. She'd done impressions, but she'd done impressions of characters in Coronation Street. She'd done them very well. She was brilliant. And EastEnders which were huge at the time in 87. Everybody watched EastEnders, everybody watched Coronation Street, and her voices were brilliant. And on the night when I saw her, I thought, fuck, you know, although I knew I was as good as her, yeah, yeah. and I thought it was a bit better than her, really, I thought she will appeal to the public. People yeah, are going to go, yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, I've seen that girl doing, you know, whoever the fuck it is on Coronation Street. Have you seen that girl doing Sally? Wouldn't you think it was here? It's fantastic. So it wasn't really a surprise that she won yeah. and I came second. And going down to the studio, Jim, it was like a dream come true. Felt like Elvis Presley going into the makeup room, four or five girls putting your makeup on, putting my suit on. As I'm sitting in the dressing room, you could hear, you know, Different things were being announced. Frankie Allen to rehearsal. Frankie Allen to rehearsal. With Bob Monkhouse all the time. With the producer all the time. Talking to the cameramen. On the night it went out live. 16 million people. Yeah. You don't even get that now, do you? No. 16 million people all over the UK. Um, I went on. I thought what I'd done was great. It was everything I'd ever dreamed of. The floor manager, as we're going live, has got these headphones on. The adrenaline yeah. that was rushing around with me, it was amazing. And he, he's got these headphones on and he's going, Quiet, please, on the studio floor, going live. 15 seconds. Then he's going, Quiet, please, quiet, please. 10 seconds going live. 
five seconds. Quiet on the studio live. Going live. Three seconds. Cue Frankie. And I was away. And I thought I'd done great. I thought I'd done the performance of my life. Thought I was going to be a huge star. Didn't happen. The phone boat at that time, whoever you thought was the best act on the night, you rang up. Your number was in the Radio Times. You rang up and registered a vote and I came second. I don't know what the figures were, so I didn't win. So from being second on Opportunity Knox and no, I won in the studio, the studio vote. And they told me that I'd, I'd been beaten very narrowly. And even Bob Monk, I said, Frankie, it's a shame you've been beaten by a few votes here. It was heartbreaking. Now, talk about a lesson in your life when you're up there and you think, I'm going to be like Elvis Presley here. I'm a big star. Three and a half weeks later, I was being very badly beaten up in a club in Bolton, fighting for me fucking life. Now, how can you go just for a few quid in a very rough pub? That's what I wanted to say because... Our careers, in a lot of way, they've kind of mirrored each other. When we've talked about life experiences and stuff, and I've been on television programmes and people say, you've got to be a star. Off this, off the back yeah. of this, you're going to be a star. And then it's just, you just go from there to there. You, you've got to be, you, you've got to be the, uh, you know, a real kind of, what's the word? You've got to be a bit of a pessimist as well, Jim, because you've got to be, you've got to set yourself up. You've got to have the psyche to be able, even now, you know, we, before this coronavirus, you know, I've got my son managing me, he's a fantastic, he's, here now, he's well. here now, he's a fantastic manager, we'll get him on soon to speak about, yeah, yeah. you know, where we're going, and um, he went to the lip of the Paul McCartney school, he was managing bands and acts and things, and, and he started managing me, and uh, we were flying, literally, we were sold out all over the UK, everywhere we went, at the end of the night, we were doing the meet and greet, hundreds of people around the club, waiting for me for a picture, shaking people's hands. We were earning decent money. It was fantastic. It was everything they'd ever dreamed of. All of a sudden, it's gone. But, be but before that, where you, where you actually made it, there was decades in between Opportunity Knox to work. To work. The wilderness. There was like a long period. And, but as the, years, as the years went on, the, the work became less and less. Less and less because... The social clubs were all closing. It became kind of out of style. Old time comedians, or should you know, mainstream comedy, seemed to be getting kind of like vilified, uh, and people weren't really going for that style of comedy anymore. Um, there were less and less venues. You couldn't perform anywhere. A lot of the pubs in the nineties and two thousands started to close, um, so you didn't have the platform. So even to be a comedian, some very difficult times, Jim. If that you owe, you owe a lot to the bloke who secretly filmed you in the pub, don't you? And, and well, I'll say I'll tell you it was. There's a comedian. Oh, sorry, not a comedian. There was a boxer, and this. Um, can I say his name? Yeah, yeah. 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 And um, you weren't with me that night. Where where you will? You know, it was. It's quite a long story, but I went into this pub. I'll say what it was called: Barry's Bar in West Derby. And uh, I used to do there every Father's Day. And I went in and there's a friend of mine, a very close friend, Derry Matthews, who was the world champion at his weight, uh -huh. boxer. Uh -huh. Very famous, great guy. And he's with his friend, his mate was sitting there with him, called Chris Woods. Now, as I'm walking into the club, I saw Chris had this phone, like a big iPhone. And I said, Chris, you're not going to film me. I don't film me. And he said, OK. Because um, I'm always scared because I'm kind of like on a bit of a tightrope, can be a bit contentious, controversial about what I say. It's different in a live environment than things that are said on the TV and things. You, you've got a little bit of freedom, a bit of latitude about what you can say. So sometimes I push the boat out a little bit, you know, when I'm working on a pub. So I knew in a pub I'd have freedom to say what I wanted to, yeah. which some people may interpret as being, you know, whatever they say now, don't say this, don't say that. So I said to him, Chris, don't film me, I don't want to be filmed today. I just want to free hand at doing what I want to do. And he said, okay, I won't film you. So when I started off, I saw he had his phone on and he was filming me. So I went over and said, switch your phone off. So he switched it off. Little did I know that 
he started filming again. Now, he didn't post the video for over a year. It was filmed on Father's Day, and I think it was the week before Father's Day that he posted it. And maybe because I refer to Father's Day on the video, it really took off and went viral. And uh, Will rang me and he said, Dad, uh, somebody's posted this thing about you. It's a video of you in this fucking club. And just like yourself, Jim, you know, the first thing, anybody else was, oh, great, you know, and we're, yeah. we're, what was the thing? We go, fuck, what did it say? Yeah, yeah. Did it say anything? And he went, um, why, what do you want me to do? And I said, look, whoever's posted it, can you get in touch with them and tell them to take it down? And he said, okay. And then he rang me back and said, we can't take it down. I said, well, three million people have watched it this week. And I went, what? And then it went, you know, to seven million. Then it just kind of exploded. So, and that was, it's just weird and strange. What can happen to you? We was doing, a, it was that June, was it the June, Will, of 2018? Father's Day, June the 17th. In the March of that year, we were, we was on a fucking organs bar in Lee, that shit all. Do you remember that? Bit? Was I there, Jim? You, you, you was the headline actor that bit. Hogan's bar. Oh, yeah. On Railway Road in Lee. That's right, we in was on Lee, there, yeah. And like, it's amazing how you, you just went from that and then bang, you were off and it was kind of like... But Jimmy, I remember that, uh, that was a woman, that, a lady that ran it, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah organs yeah. bar. I, I enjoyed that night. It was great. I struggled. I mean, you, you was you was good, but I, I struggled that night because yeah. I was I wasn't. Up, I'm not up to the. Account, so the video it went viral. It was brilliant. The rest is history, so to speak. Yeah. We've got some questions from the floor. From uh, is there are okay. all, they've, all, they've all been vetted by your manager, so they want, there'll be nothing abusive. Okay. Will Devakis from America asks, "How long does it take for you to write your material from inception to the final piece? What's the process?" Well, a lot of the material I use is kind of very old anyway, that I've been using for many years. So I'm not kind of writing material and waiting, you know, to see what kind of reaction I get from the crowd. I don't try things out. I've got a lot of material which is tried and tested. Yeah. I've been doing for years. So I've stolen really from other comics or have modified yeah. and altered the gag. So, yeah, but... Your crowd work, what you've worked out, all, yeah. all the things that you did, that is technically written. You, that is your own thing, isn't it? That yeah. is, that, that is a, you have a unique thing for like abusing the crowd and you have like... A, it's well, Jimmy, we have been very lucky, as I say, although I was kind of... Um, during the 70s and 80s and 90s, as well, probably uh, more than any other comic, apart from yourself, I was marginalised by the mainstream entertainment agencies and people in the, in the know in control of entertainment because I was blue as soon as I started being blue and being myself on stage a lot of the venues particularly in the 80s around Manchester I became very successful and very well known the Manchester lads are great and they love you taking the piss they're not quite as what's the word in Liverpool they might they're a little bit kind of um, just the same really but a little bit more sensitive but you can, with the Manchester crowd, you can really have a go at them and they'll take it as a joke. So I used to do, um, I was the MC stroke comedian at the Napoleon Inn every Friday lunch hour in Manchester. And they had four strippers on and I was on. And I was there every Friday afternoon for four years. Now, how that helped me out was, I was there in 89, I was there actually um, when I found out, it was the 17th of March, 89, that uh, my son was going to be born, you know, so it was a great, a very lucky place for me. And Larry, who was the MC with me, Larry the Teapot, who was a great act himself, they called him Larry the Teapot. Um, we worked it out amongst ourselves. Now, you've got basically the same crowd, all the lads from the Smithfield Market used to come in every Friday afternoon, a few local lads from Gorton and Bellevue. So I had to go on, I used to do every half an hour, I used to do half an hour every week. So I couldn't do the same material. So that forced me into kind of inventing situations with the crowd. And when you, people watch me now and go, wasn't that marvellous the way that he picked on that guy and he said, see that guy over there and that guy, over? so I'm making it into a routine. I'd already done it before, yeah, years yeah. before, but I just changed the names, changed the situation. You like uh, it looks fresh. If, if you've it never looks seen, fresh. If you've never seen you before. It's, it's like, but it's all, you tie everything well, Jimmy, together. Jimmy, for instance, people think 
I've had people coming up to me, if there's a scandal breaks on the TV, you know, there was a scandal broke, when, when the scandal first broke about uh, Gary Glitter, somebody came up to me and said, Frankie, fucking hell, that was only on the news last night. How did you think of the gag for tonight? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, well, I didn't. All I did was change the name from Gary Glitter. I changed it from a guy called Len Fairclough, who was on Coronation yeah, Street 20 years ago, who was in trouble for a similar thing. Was that the Florida one? The yeah. Florida, the Florida guy. Yeah, I don't say oh, it, yeah. <laughs> But, yeah, all you do is change the name. Now, I've got loads of material now. God forbid yeah, if something, yeah. if there was a disaster or if somebody was you know, arrested today. You know, say there's a politician arrested today and it came on the news. He's um, a, a child molested this guy and all that. He's going to get out to court. And I could go on stage tonight and I could do 15 minutes about it. Yeah, yeah. And people go, how the fuck did you do that? But I've just used a guy from 30 years ago, yeah, Jeremy yeah. Thorpe, who was a politician and he was involved in a sex scandal. Just use him and transfer it onto whoever is the breaking news. There's nothing new under the sun, is it? It's just reality. All comedy's been done, haven't they? So it's it's just all missed. been done. All you do is alter the names. Absolutely. Uh, John Alton says, um, hello, John. What is the best comeback when some cunt takes the piss out of you for being bald, asking for a friend? Well, it's a strange thing, really, Jim. I've had this many, many times. And I've come out with different comebacks from people. What I normally say to people is just, I had lived with it, you know, depending on what they say and how. I mean, a lot of people, people don't realize you can get hecklers. You can get people who are ready to kick off, who are very, very angry. You can get people who are genuinely just having a laugh. Now, a lot of comics, a lot of comics I've seen, and I could name them today, because you know them, overreact to hecklers. Somebody will heckle them and they'll go, yeah, like you, like you, you fucking cunts. I'll fucking kill you. Get him out. Get him thrown out. And the guy's just a young kid having a laugh. Depending on the severity of what they're saying, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll gauge my... I might just say something. Yeah, mate, I've got a bald dead. I'll show you my bald dead in a minute. It'll be right in front of your fucking eyes. I'll butt your fucking head off. I will say something, yeah, at least they don't look like a fucking Shetland pony. Just, you can become, that's another thing, Jim. A lot of comics get too um, caught up in thinking that if they get heckled, they have to come back with something that's clever. You don't have to come back with something that's clever. And people think, you know, it's kind of like a lot of these comics who, what I call the middle class comics, they think you've got to say something which is very profound. Yeah, yeah. Which is humiliating, but very funny. Yeah, that's You don't have to do that at all. In real life, and I like to think that my act and your act as well, people who are real people, genuine people, when they're on the stage, your performance should mirror real life. Yeah. So if somebody, a lot of times people shout out to me, uh, Hey, you, you baldy cunt. When was the last time you had a haircut? Instead of saying something and trying to wreck your brains, thinking, you're better off just saying, fuck off, you fucking dickhead. Yeah. It's rather, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Just... Yeah, people think, people try to be clever. They try to, to, to kind of invent clever things to say. We're not in university. This is in Oxford and fucking Cambridge. A lot of people shout out at me. I don't even say anything back. Now, I'm hoping that they'll carry on. A lot of people go, they get frightened, I'm getting heckled. Yeah, yeah. I best off nipping this in the bud straight away. I'll say something clever to this fella. Then they say, the next thing that he says, I'll get him thrown out. I let people heckle me. Because I'm letting them, I really shouldn't should be telling you these secrets. I'm letting them dig a hole for themselves, lay a trap for them. And once I think they've gone too far, I'll get them, I'll savage them. I'll do the rest of my act, but every 10 minutes I'll keep going back to them. Like a dog, like an angry dog that bites you. A dog, literally they're biting the hand that feeds them because they paid to be entertained. And they're in some ways, some of them are trying to ruin it. So not only will I hit them once with a stick, 
And they go, oh, yeah. And he sit back and go, I'm sorry you said that. I'll wait five minutes. Then I'll go, yeah, yeah, like that fucking dickhead over there that was shouting out before. And I'll give them more. So in the end, the cow on him. I mean, sometimes I've found every occasion, occasionally, you'll get an heckler that's just a prick and they just yeah. ruin the night. But the weird thing about them is they're the first person to come over and shake your hand and say, I really enjoyed that. Yeah, because they feel guilty. Yeah. What I've noticed over the years, Jim, I mean, it's no secret the kind of comic I am. I've got an act which is very off the wall. It's very kind of close. To the, I run a bit of a risk, really. Um, I'm running, what's the word? I'm on a very fine line between actually being hilarious and being maybe a little bit offensive to some people. If they're not used to me, they can't take it. Also, to, to kind of compound that, to make that worse, as I said before, because I've been marginalised by the mainstream um, entertainment agents and things, I've had to work in some of the roughest places, rougher cities in the UK. Yeah. Now, when I was a kid, the thing that used to fascinate me You'd watch a lot of old movies and people would say, oh yes, that's not cricket. Um, and people would talk about an Englishman's sense of fair play. And I used to think, what does that mean? But I can actually tell people that that's a thousand percent true based on my own experience. I've been in clubs, rough places in Manchester, which has a bit of a rivalry with Liverpool in Nottingham, in London, different places. And I've been on stage and somebody might have started heckling me. And because I'm extreme, I've humiliated them. And the rest of the guys on their table as a group, they didn't like it. They feel, this is kind of going back to, you know, Stone Age men, really, the way people react in situations. I've had like eight or nine fellas around the table. They didn't like the fact that I'd, demeaned and humiliated and made one of their tribe, tribe small so yeah. they've all kicked off yeah. and I've been in a situation on stage where I thought I'm in trouble here I've got a whole table of lads who are going to kick off on me now what I'm going to tell you now has happened hundreds of times British people generally they do have a, a fantastic sense of fair play they don't like anyone being bullied the number of times, happened to be in Nottingham once, the Victorian club in Nottingham, huge stag show, 500 fellas, rough as fuck, the girls have been on, said something to this fella and he kicked off, he came towards the stage as though he's gonna fucking hit me. He tried to throw a dig at me and I just ducked. And I said, fuck off. Is that the best you can do? You fucking dickhead. And he walked away humiliated, but his mate started kicking off as though he wanted to fight me. And I turned doing these gags and this big fella kicked off. And then another table of lads who I didn't know. One fella stood up and he went, fucking sit down, leave him alone. He's on his own. He's only doing a fucking job. He's having a laugh. Fuck with him, you'll fuck with us. And the whole table stood up. Now, this is very strange, Jim. This goes back to, I think, um, it's kind of, what's the word to use? It's it, it like going back thousands of years to when we were prehistoric men, how people reacted in certain situations. Um, something has evolved in Britain where people don't like to see other people bullied. You'll always get an Englishman who will back you up in a situation. You know, I was in a club and I was only 21, me and my mate, we were in Spain. And we'd had a bit of trouble. My mate was drunk. And there was a bit of kick-off. I won't say what they were. These fellas kicked off and they were English lads. They were kicking off and they were going to wait for us. And uh, these big fellas, fucking big men. I was only 20. They were in the 40s. So I think they were from Rochdale, Manchester. Fucking big men. They were staying in our hotel. And they came over. And they went, you're all right, Scouts. And we said, no, not really. When we come off, we're fighting these fellas. And they went, right, right. <laughs> he fucked off and he came back with these 10 fellas. Then this little fella from Rochdale just walked over to them, just started knocking them all out, you know. Yeah, yeah. And it made me very proud, really, yeah. to be a northerner. 
Yeah, yeah. To be English, knowing that although every city and every town in Liverpool hates the in, in England hates the next town, a lot of rivalry. There's rivalry in Liverpool and Manchester. There's rivalry between Wigan and Bolton, Blackpool and Preston hate each other. Newcastle and Sunderland hate each other. Yeah. You've got Ipswich and Norwich. Right. You've got Portsmouth and Southampton hate each other. When it comes to the crunch, when we're in a situation just like in the war. You'd be surprised how British people are very clannish and very supportive and they will help you out. They'll defend you. And I've found that in many times where I've been under threat and people who totally don't know me don't like the idea of and how somebody being bullied. And that's great. Yeah. And that's a great, what I think is uh, what as a nation people should be very proud of. Absolutely. Um, a couple more questions, sir. Gary Bibby, what do you think about the devolution of stand-up comedy? Has it changed? Are, are people soft now in the terms of being offended by certain subject matters? Well, Jim, I really don't want to get into this. My, my contention is this. Anybody who makes people laugh with whatever material they want to do, best of luck to them. Not my bag, it's not my cup of tea. I like doing what I think, the style that I do, I think is the best. If you believe in what you're doing is the best, go and do it. And the best of luck to you. But don't interfere with other styles of comedy. Don't be, I don't like the thought police. I don't like people coming down on and trying to analyse everything that somebody says and to try and get you to comply with their way of thinking. You know, it's a free country, so we should be able to do any style of comedy within reason, you know. Yeah, yeah. Within reason, you should be able to do. And those guys who do the alternative comedy, people who do different weird stuff, great. Best of luck to them. If you've got an audience, more power to your elbow, go for it. But don't have a go at you yeah, or yeah. me or people who think, well, what I, the style I do, I think is the best. Let everybody get on with it. Stay in your own lane, kind of thing. Stay in your own lane, yeah. Well, a lad from America, I think he's a bit backward, to be honest with you. Yeah. His name's Kungi Miller. What makes you the UK's most feared comedian? Um, <clears throat> I'm joking, you're not really backward. I've never met you at all. Yeah, probably the, the, the word, it's my son, a manager who kind of came up with the UK's most feared comedian, which has been fantastic. Yeah. It's really done well for me. I think he thought of it like a lot of people do. When people go to see a comic, they're going and they're kind of sitting in the audience. They are in some ways judge and jury comics coming out on the stage and they're thinking consciously or subconsciously yeah this guy better be good i'm gonna make my mind up if he's no good i'm not gonna laugh if he's good i'll laugh if he's clever i might clap if he's boring i'll start talking while he's on and that applies to 99 percent of comedians when people go to see frankie allen they go i'm going to see frankie allen and they're going, fucking hell, they're a bit scared. They go, I hope he doesn't fucking pick on me. I hope he doesn't pick on me missus. What happens if he says something to me fucking nan? I'm bringing me nan. So I'm bringing them to the venue. Even before I set foot on stage, they're in a mindset where they're a little bit afraid. Just like, you know, say, I've got to go to the dentist. You're not mm -hmm. scared. But you're a little bit apprehensive. I've got to have an operation next Wednesday in hospital. And you're going, oh, I don't get scared for it. Well, I don't really want, you know. I hope, uh, so people are going. And where a lot of people are walking, the big difference with me, a lot of people are kind of, I, I know the way people in this country, the way people think, people are getting ready. Who are you going to see tonight, Tommy? Oh yeah, I'm going to see a show. I'm going to see um, Billy Smegma. Billy Smegma, he's a good comedian, yeah. He's, um, yeah, he, he actually, he's only 19. He, he's just uh, come out of university. I believe he's got some very clever stuff to say about um, South America and all that. But when people are getting ready and they're going, uh, yeah, Frankie Allen, and they're going, fucking hell. Frankie Allen's on, I'm going to see, fucking hell, do my ears look big? Oh, for fuck's sake. Oh, fucking hell, when I go in, oh, I better sit at the fucking back. I don't want him, for, oh, Frankie, he'll be going under my fucking ears. So they're going in a little bit frightened, which when I pick on someone else and it's not them, they feel relief. 
So you get a bigger laugh. Just like, as I say, in prehistoric times, in the tribe, sitting around the campfire, like the chief says, kill him and we eat him. They're relieved it's not them. Yeah, yeah. So they warm to the situation and I'm picking on different people and in their mind, it's like Russian roulette. They're thinking, hang on, I'm fat. I put a bit of weight on. He's just picked on that guy over there for being skinny. Now he's picked on a fella for being scruffy. Now he's having to go with that beard, seeing that she's ugly. And they're going, whoa, I'm right in the middle here. Look at me, 20 fucking stuff. I'm going to get it. Then when they don't get it, they're relieved and it puts them in a great mood. So that's where I'd say the fear comes in. Am I allowed, one of the funniest insults to the crowd you've done? I don't know if we're allowed to say it. You stop me if we are. The fellow with one leg in Portsmouth, are you allowed to say what you, what you said to him? Well, we're not you... naming him. We're not yeah, naming the fellow. funniest fella. fucking thing. Well, this you... is another illustration, really, I'd like to bring to people's attention. Jim, you're a fantastic comic, um, and you know how difficult it is in certain, certain situations. I'll tell a story. It's a good story. And I can name the place as well. The, the fellow that's running it, um, who, who are friends of mine now, you know, I've kept in touch with them. When the video first went viral in 2018, Will, my son, he said, Dad, have we got you this job? It's down in Plymouth. And I said, OK. And I'm not coming with you. He was busy organising things for different shows. Go on your own. Get the train down. It's the Boomerang Bar. So I said, great. So it'd only been a few weeks after the video went viral. The penny hadn't really dropped that I was now going to be recognised all over the UK. So got the train to Plymouth. Got off the train, never had any recognition from anybody ever before. Nobody knew me, even going through the fucking Mersey Tunnel. My name meant nothing to people. Even the next street, people have never heard of me. And I got off the train, I'm walking down the hill into the city centre where the club was. And these young lads are walking up and a fellow went, Hello Frankie, can we have a picture? I went, Oh. Can we have your picture, photograph? I'm like, fuck, I just literally couldn't believe it. You know, yeah. how, how do you know me? I, I, you know, I'm an 80s yeah, man, I couldn't yeah. get a... No, you're on the phone. You're on our phones all the time. I went, okay, I had a picture taken. Got in the venue. Now, I don't think it was a ticket to the event. They'd, met, they'd let an awful lot of people in. And too many people really was heaving this bar. And I don't get scared of places, but I thought, the noise of eight people deep at the bar. I thought, how the fuck am I, you know, I've really got to dig deep here, even for me, to get them quiet. So I've been speaking to a guy at the bar and he had one leg. And when I looked down at his leg, he said, I lost my leg in the Gulf War, I was a soldier. I said, oh, great, mate, thanks for your service. And great guy talking to him. But he had this funny prosthetic leg. And it wasn't like what you normally see, you know, a plastic or a steel leg that people have now. He had shorts on so you could see it. And what it looked like was about 18 and 19 cans of beans glued together one after the other. I thought, F what the fuck have they done with his leg? It looked like a load of cans. So he's a great fella. We got talking to him and he was a good lad. And he went to me, he kind of gave me permission, you know, it was a good job he did. And they talk very West Country, they all talk like Long John Silver down there. And he went, Oh, Frank, you do us a favour. When you go on, will you have a go at my leg? And I said, Well, not right. God, fat Frank, go on, because all my family's here. They're always having a go at my leg. I said, Yeah, okay. So the DJ said, Frankie, do you want to go on now? It's about four o'clock in the afternoon. The noise from the crowd was horrendous. I'm not just saying it, Jim. No other comic would have gone on. You would have said, look, I'm sorry. I'm going back home. I don't want to go on. This isn't going to work. So I'm digging deep and thinking of different situations. And I said, I've got it. There's only one way to get this crowd quiet. So do you know what I did, Jim? Have I told you what I did to get them quiet? Start a fight. What you've got to do, I said to the guy who was running it, put a table right in the middle of the room, not in the corner where the DJ was. Switch all the lights up in the room so everyone can see me so when I got introduced the noise was phenomenal 
terrible noise. So as soon as I got the mic, I went, what, mate? What are you going to do? You're going to punch my fucking head in. Well, come on, punch me fucking head in. There was no one there. Yeah. But it was so crowded, you couldn't even see he was in the corner. Mm. So everybody in the room thought there was a kickoff. Thought a fella was kicking off and wanted to come on, on the table and try and... And I was saying, come on, come on. And then I said to the crowd, should we get him up? He thinks he's going to fucking knock me out. Now, because we're in Plymouth, see, um, sorry, Portsmouth, you've got to refer to another crowd, another, another town that they don't like and pretend that the guy's from there. Then it, they, he becomes their enemy. He's on their territory and I'm one of them. Exactly. So I won't mention the name of the town. I don't alienate anybody. So I said, where are you from, mate? There's no one there. Oh, yeah. And you could hear the audience oh, growling, just like they would in Wigan if yeah. the fella said, I'm from Bolton. A Lee. Yeah. Lee. Or if you went, if you were in Newcastle, where are you from, mate? Sunderland. They go, oh, fucking hell. They start getting yeah, angry. Yeah. Where are you from? Don't be coming in here, mate. When these people here have paid to see me and trying to ruin the fucking show, You're getting people angrier and angrier. So he couldn't hear a pin drop. But then I said to him, I'll see you outside later on. You couldn't go on too long without the crowd seeing him. After 10 minutes, they'd want to see him. And if they didn't see him, they'd start thinking, this is a bluff. So I had them in the palm of my hands. But I knew I only had seconds <laughs> to keep them with me. Even after the threat of a fight, they'd start getting noisy and talking if there was nothing else going on. So straight away, just like a gift from heaven, the fellow with, with the funny leg, with the one leg, he walked past me. So I went instinctively and knew what he wanted. I went, look at this cunt with his fucking leg made out of tin cans, you fucking dickhead. You were on a scooter last night, mate, going round the roundabout. You couldn't get off the fucking roundabout, you fucking prick. I've seen you, you dirty cunt, with your one fucking leg hanging around fucking pet shops, you pervert. And I savaged him. Then I had them for three or four minutes for the next half an hour. They were very quiet. I had them. But that was probably the most difficult. And, and, but because of all the experience I've had, you know, it's all right for people to say, sitting in a living room or sitting, sitting in a fucking university common room, saying, yes, uh, um, oh, yes. If I was, I could never have referred to someone's disability. That's very offensive. If you're in the middle mm. of a fucking rough venue somewhere in the UK, you know that you're not going to get paid unless you're on for at least half an hour. You know that there is a way yeah. that these people will laugh. You've got to do it. You have to use any, any means possible. Any tool at your disposal, within reason. You can't actually go up to someone and fucking hit him. But you've got to, um, as you just said, Jim, use anything at your disposal, any weapon that you can use. Absolutely. Uh, a couple of questions, then we wrap up. Darren Lewis, I have been on the end of one of your roasts, Frankie, and it was fair game to me. But have you ever had a kick-off with anybody who took it the wrong way? Well, yeah. I mean, I know more than most, really. You know better than anybody the way I am on stage and I know and I can understand the way, although 99% of people run with it and roll with it and they think it's hilarious and they understand and they know um, what I'm trying to do, the way I'm trying to do it. You do get people every now and then, not, not so much now that we've got ticket shows, but you used to get a lot of people who were a little bit thin skinned who couldn't take it. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's no secret, is it? I've been stabbed. I've been beaten up very, very badly. I've fought people on stage. I've been in a boxing ring where an old fellow walked past in a boxing ring in Liverpool. I'm working inside the boxing ring. He walked past, he was an old fella. And I said, hey, mate, the fucking hearse has gone without you. The horse is dragging your coffin down the fucking street. You better hurry up, you dying cunt. And he's just jumped into the stage, tried to punch me, I've ducked, and I've got him in a headlock, this guy. 
and he's punching me in the back and I'm still trying to finish off the gag I was doing and I'm going round in a circle. And all the audience is shouting, finish the joke off, Frankie. And he lifted me off my feet. Okay. Yeah, I've got him in the headlock. I put people in headlocks, Jim, if they're trying to hit me. <laughs> in the end, the bouncers came. But yeah, people are surprised. Not only have I been beaten up and have been stabbed and different things have happened, chased out of clubs, you know, um, chased in my car. I've had people phoning me house up after shows and threatening me. Yeah. You won't say that about me, mate. <laughs> I'm gonna come to your house, I'm gonna fucking kill you. I've it's been threatened, yeah, like that. I'm going with death threats and things. But I don't give a fuck. What I do, I love doing. There's no offence in it to me anyway. I'm not trying to upset or to demean anyone on a personal level. I just think that what I do is very funny. I'm going to wrap this up very soon, but why you say headlocks? Is it true that uh, you, you did a gig in Germany for the British Army? And, and are you allowed to say that? And the, yeah, I'll tell that story. What that story was, that was in Dortmund. And that was at the British Army base in Dortmund. And it was just after the Gulf War, I think it was 94, 95. And a guy came up to me and he said, I'm the uh, PMC. He was in charge of entertainment. He said, we've got the show on tonight, which is, um, you know, a, a, a JRC, junior ranks. So the young, a lot of young kids and a lot of officers were there. And he said, do me a favour. He said, when you go on, he said, don't mention drugs. I said, why is that? He said, we've got a bit of a problem. A lot of Scousers and some of the Manchester lads are addicted to substances. And I said, okay, but that's part of life. He said, but I'd rather if you didn't mention anything about drugs. So I said, okay, I won't do it. But one of my gags, and I'll tell you the gag now, the gag was telling a story about my brother, fictitious brother, came home from school the other night, chased him by four coppers. He had a bunch of weed cannabis in his hand he put the cannabis inside a cuckoo clock and he hid behind the couch police searched the house couldn't find anything at all they were just on the way out at 12 o'clock the cuckoo clock struck 12 and a cuckoo came out and said hey man it's the midnight hour usually gets a big laugh use the gag for years don't use it anymore because i mentioned cannabis I'm on the microphone. The next thing is a thought that had a heart attack. Bang! I was on the floor. This officer fella in the army had ran from where he was sitting, jumped on me and started hitting me yeah. on the head. So I had him in a fucking, as soon as I was on the floor, I didn't know what had happened. But you know, I'm a scouser. I've been around a little bit. You've always got to be careful. It can happen anywhere. It could happen in a garage when you're getting petrol. We're all like northern lads. You know, you, you know, you can be in any situation. Yeah, yeah, Someone yeah. can kick off. So I'm lying on the floor and this fella, I've got him by, and I've got him in this fucking headlock. And all I can hear, he had a big bald fella. All I can hear is, I told you. I, I what the fuck is this? I told you not to mention drugs. So he tried to hit me, so I started hitting him. So then he was a big lad and he got up like a fucking monster. He's standing up and I'm still like hanging off him, still hitting him. And those fucking murder. Some people were kicking off, saying, what the fuck are you doing? He's telling a joke. So just a fucking nightmare. Yeah, Jimmy, that's a true story. You have a, you, there's a, I mean, I thought I was writing a book. Uh, get, get in, no, well, not really. Book, is there a book coming, Will, at some Now, part? look, just before we go, I'd like to invite my son, Will, on stage here, just to, as my manager as well, just to tell people, a lot of people are making, you know, kind of like making inquiries now about where we stand when the lockdown is lifted with regards to buying tickets for shows, where to see me, I don't know, so if you can just come and uh, just pass comments on that for a few minutes, Will. You want to sit here for a minute? No, no, no. All right, I'll just stand at the back. You know, this guy, aren't you? We're going to take the shine off your dad, you're smashing it. No, but Will, they want to know, you know, where, where, where we are. are. We're very relaxed here, we're, we're, there's no one, I mean, it's, 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 it's raw. Are you coming back in a minute? Oh, for All right. He's closing off with it. Right, yeah, no, no worries. Yeah. So, this is, this, this is Will, this is, this is, um, Frankie's son and manager. What's happening, guys? You okay? How's it going, Jim? I'm not so bad. So what, what's coming up for him? So we we ran 20 shows in 2020, which was quite difficult to do. Nine at the start of the year, but 11 social distanced 
which was was like a struggle, mate, but still managed to get there. So we're back on the road from May 17th, social distance shows for five weeks, back from June 26th on the road. So we're actually elevating the uh, the production quality of the show. We're going into higher quality venues. We're going to be doing a lot of theatres. We've got a lot of theatres booked, bigger capacity venues. And that was it. That was the plan from the start. So we're all over the UK. Um, if there's anyone, any of your audience that would like to see Frank anywhere, particularly within the UK, the world, yeah. it, it would be great for us to know in the comments, if you wouldn't mind, let us know where you'd like to see Frank, but we're in Swindon, Maidstone, Coventry, we're, you know, we're going to be down south, we're going to do London, we've got shows planned everywhere all over the UK, and uh, go from strength to strength. So all these good. shows after June be socially distant, so it'll be back no, to normal, so, back, so, back to so normal. The, the plan is, I mean, we, we've got a little bit of leeway in, in how we're approaching it, but the social distanced events are supposed to take place from May 17th up until June 26th. June 21st, sorry, but June 26th is the first weekend. Okay. Um, so it's a five week period. So what we decided to do is we're, we're blasting June 26th onwards with full capacity shows. Because the social distance ones, I mean, Frank will be able to tell you in a minute, soul destroying mate, to be honest no, with you. No, the they really. Because, well, they're not worth anything financially, but it's the, it's the aspect of when you actually get on stage, because I host all the shows, I compare all the shows, there's no atmosphere. Because yeah, yeah. people are sat in the audience, it's table service, they've all got masks on anyway. You have it's to just, wear masks in the audience. You have to wear masks. Oh, right. No, you have to, you have to oh, take right. a mask off when you can have a drink or food, okay. but it's mask in motion. So if you need to go to the toilet or you need to go anywhere, you've still got a mask on. Oh. So yeah, well, look, I've said my part here. If you want to come and see Frankie live, frankieallen.co.uk. <laughs> or anywhere in the UK where you'd like to see Frank, let us know, but we're everywhere. And we'll put a link, you're on Memo, and you can get Ross if you want oh, to Oh yeah, I'll let, got... I'll let Frank tell you about that. Fill him in on Memo. Well, what the Memo is, it started out... Um, Cheers, Jim. Cheers, pal. <laughs> yeah, Memo, it started out as... Uh, it's an agency. There's Memo in Europe, and there's um, Harpo, as it will, in the States. Cameo. Cameo in the States, and I've actually done a couple of American ones, Jim. Yeah, cool. I'll just tell you about it. What they are, they want people who are kind of celebrities, so to speak, anywhere in the UK. They've got hundreds of people, and you can get in touch with the agency and say, for instance, look, um, Paul Gascoigne, can Paul Gascoigne wish my daughter happy birthday? Yeah. She's a big fan. So Gascoigne will make this five minute, you know, two minute video and uh, congratulations, Diana, on your birthday. Have a lovely day. God bless Paul Gascoigne. And, and then the agency, we film it at home. Will Films me. We send it to the agency and they send it to the, the client and we're, we're making money on that. It's very, very good. So that's memo. We're available for that. But what it's kind of morphed into, it started out as an American comedian called Gilbert Gottfried. Yeah, no one. And he's got this strange voice, a funny voice, and he does a lot of these roasts. He roasts people. He roasted David Hasselhoff. He's very, very good, but it's kind of something that I like his approach. He goes on, he's slagging people, calling people. He does this gag about um, David Hasselhoff. He was calling him these different names and he's a freak and he's very lucky to get on the TV. His career's in, and he's going, his career's in fucking ruins. It's really ruined. And the guy's only sitting there called the roast in the States. Yeah, yeah. So I'm roasting people, mainly in Europe now, but it's all England. So it morphed into from wishing people happy birthday. It's mainly young lads who want me to savage yeah, yeah. their mates. Yeah. So, for instance, a guy came on a few weeks ago and it's from a place in London, Southall, for their local football team. They play on a Sunday morning. And this fella said, can you mention, can't remember the name, but Billy Edwards, he's our goalie. He's let 11 goals in in four games because everyone kicks the ball over his head. So I have to go on and go, Billy, Billy Edwards, Frankie Allen in Liverpool. Listen, mate. The next time some dickhead kicks the ball over your stupid fucking head, I'm getting the train down to your house, I'm dragging you to the fucking pitch and showing you how to save a fucking ball. You fucking dickhead, when the ball goes up, stick your fucking hand up. What's wrong with you? You fucking... And I'll do all that. And the lads love it. Yeah. And that's what they're paying for, you know, to be roasted. And so we're doing very well on that. 
that Carol Baskin got done on that, didn't you? Somebody, somebody said to him, uh, to Jimmy Seville, my friend Jimmy Savile. And it, that I've Carol, seen that. Tiger what King. happened? I, I don't know the full story. Something like, um, somebody said, will, will, will you say hello to my friend Jimmy Savile? Uh, because she doesn't know who Jimmy Savile Well, was. she wouldn't know, would she? No, but um, fair play to her. Anyway, um, do I have one or two more questions. Why, are all, why are all scousers witty? I think, yeah. Natural comedians. I think the quickness comes from um, what people don't realise in Liverpool during the 1860s. There was literally, it was literally the capital of Ireland in England. There were more Irish people who tend to be very, very quick witted for some reason. And th this kind of mindset has grown up among a lot of Scousers where they're very quick, that's the word, quick. They're quick to, to laugh at things, quick to pick on people. They've got a very quick mindset. I remember you telling me a story um, when you first started out and you only had 15 minutes or something and you went to a club and they wanted, was it three quarters? Well, they wanted an hour or yeah. something. And you rolled up and you said, oh, man, uh, someone's broken my car and, and stole, stole all my gear. Yeah. And you kind of got away with it kind of thing. There was that cunningness, that, that kind of quick witted. Jimmy, that. it's a lot of scousers, as you say, they're living on the wits, they're very cunning, very kind of like, what's the word? Not cunning, is that, that's like probably a bit disrespectful. Very um, astute, very shrewd, very clever in a lot of situations. I'm not saying, you know, the cities in Britain, people and the big towns, I'm not having to go at anyone that lives in the countryside, but because they've been brought up in a different environment, they're a little bit different where you become a kind of, um, you know, not a spiv, but you can see things coming. Manchester, Liverpool, London, Birmingham, the Newcastle, all the big cities, Cardiff, people are quicker on the uptake, they can see things coming. Where in the countryside, people are very nice. Yeah, yeah. A lot of places I used to work, you go down into Cheshire, parts of Wales and the like. People, where people are very, you know, nice people working, they've never seen violence. Yeah, yeah. To the extent that people have in the cities and the big towns or in the north of England. So I think that wittiness of people who've had to literally live on their wits. They never knew where the next meal was coming from. They never knew in a yeah. situation if they were going to be attacked. They never knew if they were going to get locked up for something. So people of the minds have become very quick and, and Liverpool people, for whatever reason, I still don't know, have got this humour about them where they think that uh, they're very quick to uh, take the piss out of people. So I went to do a bit of work for Chubby Brown's management company, sticking posters up in our tolerant country. And uh, you get a, a selection of free tickets to give to shop owners. But when I went to Liverpool, I've never seen as many smackheads who have shops. I got did I got done at this shop. The, the, these two rough looking lads at the next side of the shop he goes, Yeah, this is our shop. And I'm dickhead me from Wigan. But there's two tickets, and then they're going up the are dragging piss heads up saying, This is Terry, he's got a shop too. Can he have two free tickets? Kind All of that, thing? Yeah. But fair play. I know. think it goes back generations from when the Irish first landed. In Liverpool because of the potato famine they were very very poor they had nowhere to live and they've had to survive it's kind of a survivalist thing they've had to survive yeah. on, the, on on purely on the wits and it's made them very quick mentally yeah. and um, you know I had a grandmother my dad's mother was absolutely hilarious you know, she yeah. just you'd be talking to her as you were talking you'd start laughing yeah, yeah, yeah. she'd um, just the way they phrase things I think and I think it comes back from old Ireland funny bones yeah, you know. Um, one final question from me. Fame, was it like? Are you, did you, do you enjoy being famous? Is it, there's a downside to it? Well, Jimmy, I'm a very dark figure. I know, I'm not saying you won't like me saying this. The fame that I've achieved now, um, it doesn't bother me. I can take it or leave it. You know, on the way here today, Went for petrol, a guy came out and they got Frankie, Frankie Allen and can have a picture and all this. It doesn't really bother me, I can take it or leave it. Even when we do the shows, we've done some big venues. When we do the meet and greet and people are queuing up for pictures, we don't want the Hilton in Liverpool. And, you know, huge hundreds of people queuing up for my picture. And you'd think 
that you go fucking hell you think oh isn't this fantastic this makes me feel great i feel like elvis that's not how it makes me feel i can literally take it all leave it doesn't bother me yeah. what i like about the situation now is vindication of all the people that wrote me off yeah all the people who bad mouthed me all the people who tried to get me into trouble all those people and this may turn into a kind of a muhammad ali rant now okay. like the rumble in the jungle but i don't really care all you people you agents who wrote me off and wouldn't give me any work all the other comics who said i was no good i was too blue i was this i was that i shouldn't be allowed to go on stage all the people who had more success than me but you didn't have any talent and i had all the talent but i had no success all the people who demeaned me and denigrated me my buzz now is seeing the look on their faces and people who didn't give me any work when i struggled even going back four or five years ago now i've had the chance last year this year the year before i confronted one guy who didn't give me any work he had a club and I used to get him strippers because he was supposed to be a friend of mine. I used to get him strippers very cheap. I don't work for him very cheap. He started putting big shows on. He always used other comedians and give them like big fucking money. And I was struggling. I was literally starving and he wouldn't give me any work. When the video went viral, he got in touch with Will and he went, I want Frankie for this show. And I said, even if he was the last person on earth, that's what I'm like. I swore I'd see the day mm. of that bastard. And I had the opportunity. He was in this fucking club that I went to. And I saw him. And he went, all right, Frankie. And I went, yeah, I'm okay. I knew, I prayed that one day I see the day of you, you cunt. Bet you're sorry now you never gave me any fucking work. Bet you're sorry now that you demeaned me, slagged me off, you never rated me. I would rather die than do any work for you now, you prick. Now that made me feel yeah. 10 feet tall. That was like being on, you know, whatever. The Sands Hotel in Las Vegas. That was like being Elvis to me. Not the fact that people, okay, yeah. people stop me in a garage, can have a picture, great. I can take it or leave it. But like yourself, Jim, I've been vilified, denigrated, demeaned. Whatever word you can say for people attacking you on every level, I've had it. Been attacked physically, mentally, verbally, in every way. People have tried to destroy me. Now, the buzz I get now is by saying to certain people who are in the business, they want me now. And I'm saying, yeah, you didn't want me. You want me now. But now I don't want you. Fuck off. And they need you now. They need me now. I don't need them. And like you said to me, half of these agents now are sat at home in filthy dressing games wanking because they've nothing better to fucking do. Huh? Well, I don't know about that, Jim. <laughs> but... Certainly, I think we'll have to cut that off. But, uh, but <laughs> it's a great feeling. It's a great feeling, and we've all had it in every aspect of your life to be vindicated. It's a great feeling, you know, if a bit you've been out with a bird and you find out, you know, that she fucks you off, or maybe some of the young lads yeah 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 that the heartbroken it's a great feeling maybe if you meet someone else and you're really involved with them and you're out one night and you're with your new bird and you see your ex and she's let herself go yeah and she looks like a baguette and it's a great feeling it's a great feeling say for instance if you know you've had a fight with someone you've had a street fight someone's give you a good hiding then you hear you know, a couple of years later, that they're very ill. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Alan. You've made it. You've done it. Great. Uh, thank you very much for coming in and seeing us. Jimmy, you're story. welcome. Jimmy O. Not just me, Frankie Allen. There's a few of us still out there who've got real talents. Jimmy O. Very original. 
very talented, multi-dimensional, in a class of his own, brilliant comedian. Uh, get him on, get him on, get him on, he's great. I need me a cutting him to lose a bit of weight, but I can see him clean up for you. Anyway. The uh, only thing is, Jim, I came in here and I thought this was a kind of like Donny Osmond tribute. Then I saw your fucking head. But you look well, he looks great. Uh, Donny Osmond with a thyroid problem. But uh, thank you very much. Uh, if you've liked this, please subscribe to the channel. Smash the like or dislike button. It doesn't really matter. If you want to donate to the channel so I can get an haircut and a new shirt, uh, there's links under here. We'll put all Frankie's socials under here so you can memo, you get roasted, uh, see him live. Thank you very much, Mr. Frankie. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on, Jim. All the best, mate.